Okay, let's uh, open our Bible to the letter of 2 Timothy. A couple of weeks ago when I um, was in this context, I didn't focus upon the two verses that I wish to do so today, verses uh, 16 and 17 of chapter 3. And I just can't scoot uh, to the next section without uh, focusing upon these two very important uh, verses. So informative. But uh, let me read the context so that we see something of the setting. In chapter 3, beginning with verse 14, and I'll read through verse 2 of chapter 4. But uh, take your Bible, and uh, this is the word of the Lord. But as for you... Continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you've known the sacred scriptures, which are able to, to, to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I solemnly charge you before God in Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead, and because of his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching. Well, this is the time of year when uh, yard sales are popping up all through the neighborhoods. Can you be found on a Saturday morning canvassing those uh, streets and seeing if you could find a yard sale? That happens uh, once in a while in our home where, uh, you know, Gail will ask me, she'll say, uh, hey, you want to drive me, you know, around today? And I say, well, okay. And uh, so we go through the major arteries you know, of, the, of the town here and look for the signs. And she said, well, pull down that street. Okay, you know, I gotta follow orders. And we pull along and she'll say, yeah, well, go past it real slow so I can look. And so I drive slow, kind of like I'm casing the joint. And she said, well, that looks like a good one. Park over here. So again, I obey orders park over there, she gets out and comes back with something. And I said, well, what is it? She said, well, it's a, it's a thingamajig. And I said, well, I can see that, but what is it? Well, it's a thingamajig. And so we go, you know, down to the next street, and she comes back with a whatchamacallit. And so we... We leave that, you know, that day you got a thingamajig and what you would call it. It's a pretty successful day. You go home and you can find some of the most interesting things that people want to get rid of. Do you like browsing like that? Flea markets, perhaps, or thrift shops? Yeah, you know, we, and we say to ourselves under our breath, you know, well, you know, one man's trash is another person's treasure. So we look for that one great find, and you can find them out there. They are some great finds. And I remember the story of a man named Michael Sparks from Nashville, Tennessee in 2007. And he was walking and browsing through a thrift shop, and he came upon this very unique old parchment. And he said uh, to himself, he's, you know, he said, well, that, that is just beautiful. It looks like it could be engraved. And so he bought it. He bought it for $2.48 and took it home and began to examine it further. And upon examination, the more he looked into it, he discovered that he had the most well-preserved of the original documents of the Declaration of Independence. I mean, and there were only like 200 of the original ones. And this was just, well, he sold it for $477,000. <laughs> Bought it for $2.48. Now, I wonder how many hundreds of people walked up and down those aisles 
And, and they had no clue what they, what they were looking at was the Declaration of Independence. And then they never recognized its value. How many of them picked it up, put it back on the shelf, uninterested? I wonder what the owners of the thrift shop thought <laughs> when they discovered that amongst all the stuff that was in their shop, there was something sitting there that was worth nearly a half a million dollars and never recognized it, had no clue of the value. Now, Mr. Sparks went away with a whole lot of money after he sold that. But here's the thing. You and I have something that is worth far more, far, far more than what Mr. Sparks found. We have the Word of God, and you're holding, many of you, a copy of the Word of God, something that is unique and different, and there's no other book like it. Now, think about it. Think about the significance of this, that you hold a copy of immeasurable value because God has spoken, and what he has said, he has recorded in a book. And you're holding a copy of that. And now, tragically, there are people who walk right past the Word of God and never recognize its value. You can go through a hotel and you can look in the drawer and there is a copy of the Bible. Or somebody has a copy that they've stuffed into a closet. And they don't recognize what they have and the value of that. Now, just what is the significance of this book? Verse 16, all scripture is inspired by God. Now, you see, Paul had to invent a new word in order to get his, his point across, and that word is inspired, which is like two words that he shoved together and created a new one. Now we see this word in literature after this, but we've never seen it before this time. And so he shoved this, this word that some of your Bibles translated literally, God breathed. Now what does that mean? Well, think of it like this. Just as the Holy Spirit breathed life into the inanimate clay of Adam, so the scripture is the breath of God. It's a living book because it's God's breath. It's his word. And there's no other book like it on the planet that what it contains here is in this book alone. Isaiah 40 says, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God remains forever. Forever. Now, what other writings in all of history can make that kind of claim? There is none. Now, I want us to consider today the supreme value of Scripture. And my goal today is that you will feed on this, that you will devour it, and that you will savor it. What I mean by savor is meditating upon it, thinking about it, and thinking upon it, because in this book, we meet God. It's the only book where we meet God on the whole planet, and you're holding a copy. Now, this is a, this is a book that makes very big claims. Jesus said when he was praying for believers, sanctify them by the truth. Your wor word is truth. Now, truth Truth, by, well, by definition, would be something that is timeless. It, it doesn't change. It's truth. And that means that the Bible is timeless. I remember reading a, a very popular media personality who, who claimed that the Bible needed to be amended because it, uh, many parts of it were outdated. And so he recommended that because it didn't fit the culture of our day, 
in our modern times that there were parts of it that needed to be changed, it needed to be amended. But truth never needs to be amended to fit the culture because it's always, always relevant. Whether you are in the 1300s, 1500s, or 2023, it's always, always relevant. And that's the scripture. Truth doesn't need to be amended. Now, where do you find truth today? Where we're told by, by society that, that each person has his or her own truth. So my truth may be different than your truth. Well, that's utter nonsense because that doesn't fit with reality. You can't live by that. You certainly can't balance your checkbook like that or you'll be in trouble really fast. God's truth has been fixed, and it operates in our world, and that's why we go to Genesis 1 through 3, the foundation of understanding what reality is. When the Apostle Paul was preaching to the Athenians, all of these philosophers who had an entirely different worldview of understanding reality, he began by taking them to Genesis 1 in order to lay that foundation. And he said, God made the world and everything in it. He is Lord of heaven and earth. That's really real. And where you find that is in the Bible. Now, at Fellowship Bible, we've always been unapologetic about making the Bible our chief means for growing up in Jesus Christ. Because we want bold and well-established Christians who know their Bible and that making disciples always, always begins in the pulpit. It always has. It's modeled for us in, in Acts 2.42 where the early Christians devoted themselves to the teaching of God's Word. It's what Jesus said in the Great Commission, go and make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them everything that I taught you. And we have all of that teaching that's found in the apostles' writings and what they have given to us. And so regular, consistent, systematic, expository preaching of God's Word is where we begin to build up and make disciples. And we've done that for a long time, and we're not going to stop. Now, I wonder how many of your classmates or some of the, your coworkers would be surprised to learn that you believe the Bible to be true and trustworthy. Would they raise their eyebrows? If you told them that you believe the record that God created the heavens and the earth, would they look like, you know, at you like you came from another planet? Would they be surprised to learn that you believe that God created the first man from clay and he named him Adam? Or that you believe that Eve was created from the rib of Adam or that Jesus was born of a virgin mother, which our biology textbooks say is impossible? Would they look at you kind of like, wow, how can you believe that book? I mean, it's been proven to be historically and scientifically inaccurate, and it's culturally outdated. And the God of the Bible is cruel and intolerant. I don't trust anybody who reads and, and looks into that book, other people would say. Would they say that about you? Well, first of all, I think we need to challenge them on the assumption that it's historically and scientifically inaccurate because scholars and scientists are always catching up to what the Bible has already said. But beyond that, I think more fundamentally is why do I trust the Bible? Why do I trust it and rely upon it and believe it to be true? On what basis do I believe the Bible to be true? Well, I have two reasons, quickly. And the first reason is that Jesus himself believed the Bible to be authoritative and trustworthy. Authoritative meaning that it has the right to judge us, to tell us how to live, and we're accountable to it. 
to, to abide by its writings. But Jesus himself, and even non-Christians, would respect Jesus. And the accounts that we have of his life in the Bible itself were written only within maybe three decades of his life. So therefore, there wasn't time to like make up some kind of fabrications that were outlandish. No, no. They were written by people who had seen him and understood what he said. And Jesus is the one who, quote, who said and quoted out of Deuteronomy when he was confronted by Satan, man must not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So why do I believe the Bible and on what basis? Well, I stand with Jesus Christ. And based upon what he believed, I'm going to go along with that. I think I'm in pretty good company. But secondly, God the Holy Spirit convinces me that this is the word of God. I think the Westminster Confession is right when it says, our full, full persuasion and assurance of its infallible truth and divine authority, that is, we're fully persuaded, we're fully assured that it's, it's divine truth and authority is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. You know what that means? That in a very real sense, when you and I read the Bible, God takes charge and he convinces us that what we're reading is true. It's like the Spirit of God whispers to us and says, that's true. And, and so you and I could, would talk, could talk to a skeptic, and, and we could try to convince them by laying out a whole argument of saying, you know, look at the history of the Bible, look at the writers, how they all agree, you know, it's many, many writers, but one story, and look at its unique characteristics, and we could lay all that out, and they may walk away with a greater admiration of the Bible, but they may never be convinced that it really is the word of God until the Holy Spirit convinces them. And so it's kind of a mystery, isn't it, how that works. It's a divine work of convincing us and bearing witness with our spirit that what we're reading is truly the word of God. And it's an amazing thing how skeptics, when they read the Bible for themselves, they begin from, with doubting the Bible, and they move from that to being curious about the Bible, to being admiring the Bible, and then eventually embracing and believing the Bible. Now, how does that happen? Well, Hebrews 4.12 describes how it does. It says the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, just like a laser beam. It just works its way right into the very core of the person's soul and mind. And so it's God himself that moves the needle from somebody who says, well, if the Bible is the word of God, to the place where they say, since the Bible is the word of God. And that's where I'm at. I'm at the sense the Bible is the word of God, and I have no question about it. And that's where Paul is going in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Since the Bible is the word of God and it's God-breathed, then it's profitable for any man or woman to equip them and make them complete for every good work. Now, in those two verses, I want to... Uh, to, to just lift out um, several ways of making the Bible the, the best use of the Bible. Let me put it like that. And the first way that we make the best use of our Bible is to have a, a rich diet by feeding on all of Scripture as the Word of God. And that's where it begins. All Scripture is inspired by God. All of it. Now, you know, the emphasis is upon the completeness of it, from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Now, there are those who will miss 
uh, use the word inspire, and they will redefine it in a way that Paul never meant. And the way they redefine that word inspired is that they believe that the writers were caught up in some kind of like religious enthusiasm. And in this state of being carried along by this heightened sort of, you know, religious experience, then they wrote down these things. So they say, well, they were inspired in that sense. And so that they were driven along by their feelings. Well, that's not what the Bible says about itself. Second Peter 121, it says, No prophecy came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So we're not talking about some ecstatic experience where they're just caught up in this and they begin to write. Others will use inspired in the sense like saying, well, Shakespeare was inspired. And he wrote, you know, Romeo and Juliet and Hamlet and other great works of, of writing. But that's not what the scripture says about itself. Theologians describe and speak about the Bible as the plenary, verbal, inerrant, and infallible word of God. Now, that's a mouthful, isn't it? But it's all very, very important. So let me break it down. It's plenary in the sense that it, the all of it, the fullness of it, from Genesis to Revelation, all of it is the word of God. It is verbal in the specific words that are used in Scripture, even down to the tenses of the verbs and the grammar. All of it, the verbal, the, the words that are used there, it's inerrant in that it does not contain error, and it is infallible in that it is incapable of having any error. Now, when we think of that, we think of the original documents. And, uh, and what we have before us is so, so close to the original that we can say and have full confidence that what we're reading is truly the words of God. Now, since we believe that the God of the universe is behind Scripture, and we also believe that he has given to us precisely what he intended for us to, to learn and to live by, and it's, an, it's authoritative. It's authoritative in that it has the right to direct our lives, and it has the right to judge us. It has the right to call us to action, and we are accountable to what we do with it before God. So that's the first. How do we make the best use of it? We use all of it as the inspired word of God. But secondly, we feed on the scripture because it's profitable. It's profitable. People today are, are looking for healthy physical diets, and they're looking for diets uh, that work. And when I say that, I'm not talking about necessarily losing weight. I'm talking about just a healthful and a complete diet. And uh, in, it's a, it's a, there's a lot of money to be made today for that. It wasn't true when we were growing up. You know, we were all, you know, running out getting hot dogs and stuff like that. But these days, they're talking about clean food. You got to have clean food with no additives, no chemicals. And there's websites that are devoted to advising about what is a healthful diet. And, uh, and, and many people will go to those websites to learn about this. And people are asking them, what is most profitable for my body? What is most nutritious? What are the most nutritious greens that are out there? And so we have what we call superfoods. Well, are you as interested in investing in a healthful and healthy soul as you are a healthy body? So what's most profitable for your soul to eat? It's the bread of life. It's the word of God. And the Bible, the Bible is not true because it works. It works because it's true. You start with that and understand that that's where it's coming from. So it talks about it's profitable and how is it for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training 
in righteousness. And this is how it operates. Now, there are occasions where the Holy Spirit um, can take the same passage that a whole group like ourselves are, are reading, and he uses it in such a way as to teach one person and correct another person all at the same time. And it's, and it's an amazing thing. For example, let's take the account in, in Luke 8, the account where Jesus is asleep in the boat, and there's a storm, and the, the disciples are struggling and straining with the oars to try to, to manage this boat on the Sea of Galilee with the waves and the wind, and they're afraid that they're going to sink and drown, and they appeal to Jesus to wake up and to help them, and Jesus calmly takes charge, and he stills the storm in an instant. And the disciples now are not afraid of the storm, but they're afraid of Jesus. Because to them, they're asking the question, who is this man who has this kind of power to still the, the, you know, the weather, the universe, you know, the, what, what's going on around us? And, uh, and Jesus, or, or the Holy Spirit, will take that passage and he will use it in different ways. For one person, he humbles them. They're reading this or they're listening to a sermon about this and they are moved to worship the Lord. There's a sense where they feel like they need to get on their knees before him in submission and in worship because of the majestic God who is portrayed there, omnipotent in power. But then your neighbor sitting next to you, the Holy Spirit takes that same passage and infuses courage in that person because they are nearly paralyzed with worry. And they have been wondering, is God with me? And wondering what's going to happen in the future. And they feel like they are in the storm. And through that same passage, the Holy Spirit whispers and says, I'm with you. It's going to be okay. Now, the neighbor that's sitting ahead of you, that person is gently corrected by the Holy Spirit because they've been hesitant to step out and do something that they know they should be doing that God is directing them. And so they, again, been paralyzed by fear, but it has shredded their trust in the Lord. And in that, the Holy Spirit brings them and steers them like, you know, a course correction. You're driving down the highway and you swerve in the wrong lane. You got to get back in the right lane. And that's what the Holy Spirit does with the word of God. He gets us back into the right lane and corrects us. And so that person is brought to the end of themselves in repentance. It says, God, forgive me. I have been paralyzed by fear and not trusting in you. And the same passage can be used in different ways. So we should expect the Holy Spirit to feed us. It's profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And that's why you come back to the same passage, like you could be reading through Exodus, and you're looking at the people of Israel and how Moses is leading them. And you see something that's so relevant to you right here in the moment, whereas a year ago when you were maybe reading the same passage, it was something else. You know how that works. Well, there's a third use of how we, how we feed upon the Scripture, and that is we feed on the Scripture because it fully equips us for life. Fully equips us. And this is really the, the end goal. So that, as a purpose clause, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So the end goal is that Christians many of whom are sitting in our room today, that you would be mature, that you would be thinking properly instead of improperly, that you would be understanding what the will of the Lord is and that you would be acting on it with your hands and your feet and putting it and plugging it into life. So let me suggest five ways that you can get the most from reading the Bible. The first of these that I would recommend is, is to begin by asking help from the Holy Spirit. That's where I always start. It, it, this, is, this is a book that, that comes from God, and we are just merely creatures. 
Who are we to think that we've got it all figured out? We need help. We need God's help. And what we find here is that, you know, as Isaiah 55 says, the heaven, as the heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Since that's true, we need help. Ask the Holy Spirit. That's the first thing. Secondly, expect God to speak to you because it is profitable. And the Holy Spirit is a person and he dwells within you. And he's a, it's a relationship that we have with the Holy Spirit. And he will use the Bible as a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And we can read it with the kind of ears and eyes to receive. And, and so we should expect you know, to, to hear from the Lord, to sense his, his leading. Thirdly, not only ask the Holy Spirit for help and expect, but thirdly, ask questions. You know, engage with the passage. Interrogate the passage, such as asking the question, well, what does this passage teach me about God? How do I understand the plan of God's salvation in Jesus Christ better from having read this? Or we interrogate the passage by asking, well, what does this teach me about being a disciple of Jesus? So ask questions and get engaged. Number four, seek to apply it to your life. And don't ever leave without asking the question that since this really is God's word, what changes should I make in my life? And then number five, who do you know who needs to hear this? And how can you tell them? Because we want to pass it along. So that, that's, that's a, the, the great thing about those two verses. They're just packed with such great things. Let me, let me close with a vitamin pill that is from Jeremiah 15, 16, that says, Your words were found, and I ate them. Your words became a delight to me and the joy of my heart. So would you make it your goal to regularly feed upon God's word? And now the Bible never talks about how much of it you should be reading in one sitting, but it does talk a lot about meditating on it, even to the point of saying meditating on it day and night. So we need to think upon it, whether it's a lot that you're reading or a very little, but this is the only book on the planet that contains the words of life to give you a robust and full and abundant experience with God because of what you're reading. So don't just nibble on it, devour it and read it and savor it because the Bible is the most valuable thing you have. It's worth more than any copy of the Declaration of Independence. And why? Because in this book, you meet God. And you can't beat that. That's the best thing in life. Meeting God. But let's pray. Our Lord, as we think upon that which you have given to us as a gift, this holy scriptures, we ask that you would train us up and grow us up and mature us in Jesus Christ by use of this Bible so that when we read it, we don't come to it just as a, making a check mark that we've read it, but rather come with expectation of hearing from you. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, one who teaches us, who is our encourager and our helper and our counselor, and who really, really wants us to grow up in maturity. And he really wants to help us to live this Christian life. So thank you, Spirit of God, for even, even teaching us today as we review these two wonderful verses in 2 Timothy 3. And it's in the name of Christ we pray.